Good evening. And welcome. My name is Ben Tudlow, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Geoscience in the Faculty of Science and lead for the Gallagher Colloquium series. Thank you for joining us online for this evening's Gallagher Colloquium lecture. We are recording today's session and we'll be posting this video on the Faculty of Science website. I encourage you to check out our website, science.ucalgary.ca, for event listings and video updates. Just a reminder, should our webinar become disconnected before the event ends, allow us a minute to restart the webinar. You'll be able to rejoin the webinar by using the same login link. Hosting this year's series online provides us with a greater opportunity to engage with attendees from around the world and to avoid leaving our homes on these bitterly cold days. As we gather this evening, I like to think about who I'm sharing this virtual space with now, both here in Calgary and around the world. We are broadcasting from Calgary, which is located on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Pekani, and the Gaina First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Region of Alberta, or Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and that, and that the traditional backfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call the city of Calgary. Before we get, begin tonight's presentation, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the Gallagher family for making this series possible through their generous philanthropy and vision for deep connection between the university and the community. The Gallagher family has provided the Department of Geoscience and the Faculty of Science with the opportunity to develop and grow the Gallagher Colloquium series to strengthen our scientific community by increasing scientific knowledge, creating public awareness and establishing connections with our alumni, community, students, faculty and staff. Thank you, Tom and Fred Gallagher, for your continued support of this public lecture series and for being champions of science. The Gallagher Colloquium series continues to be an invaluable way to connect science with our community and our community with science. On a personal note, I feel extremely privileged that through the generosity of the Gallagher's, students and researchers here at the University of Calgary and our broader U of C community are exposed to some of the very best scientists in the world. Now, it is my very great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Evan Smith. Dr. Evan M. Smith is a research scientist at the Gemological Institute of America who uses diamonds to explore the deep interior of the earth. His research helps to highlight diamonds as some of the most scientifically valuable materials of our planet. Dr. Smith's work has been published in Science and Nature as well as being featured in the Washington Post, The Economist, and on National Public Radio. Dr. Smith hails from Ontario and holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in geological engineering from Queen's University and a PhD in geology from the University of British Columbia. He spent two years as a Lidicote postdoctoral fellow at GIA before joining as a research scientist. I first came to, into contact with Evan's research back, well, way back in the before time in 2019, if you remember how long ago that was, at the final meeting of the Deep Carbon Observatory in Washington, DC. Evan gave a short TED style talk about his work on diamonds and I was absolutely riveted. His talk, even though it was maybe just five or 10 minutes long, was clear, visually stunning and scientifically st stimulating. And well, it was just plain awesome. I'm sure he will deliver another incredible talk tonight. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Evan Smith, who will tell us about how the finest diamonds hold Earth's deepest secrets. Welcome, Dr. Evan Smith. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak to this group. I'm really pleased to be here. Now that's no pressure now, is it, to give a riveting talk, uh, but Okay, so tonight we're talking about the, the world's finest diamonds and the secrets within them. And this is a story that sort of unfolded over about the past five years. And I've been very fortunate to work with an incredible team of co-authors uh, listed here on a few papers. And uh, there are some new papers coming down the pipes that uh, I'll sort of allude to, but I won't fully spill the beans on. Uh, but just so that you know that this is a, a continually evolving story. So we're going to be talking about the finest diamonds, diamonds like this one here. And this is actually a 163 carat emerald cut diamond that was cut from the diamond that's shown on the cover of science here in the bottom left. So 
this is the kind of diamond we're going to be talking about and see what kind of information we can squeeze out of it. Uh, now we're talking about diamonds, uh, so maybe it's fitting that we're coming up on Valentine's Day. So I hope everyone's got their diamond jewelry ready to give to their loved ones. But let's talk about diamonds in general for a second. And from a geological perspective, where do these things actually come from? Well, most diamonds that we mine come from these volcanic pipes called kimberlites. There are also some related volcanic rocks that come from the mantle. Sometimes these pipes are weathered and we find these diamonds in alluvial deposits. Uh, but the first kimberlites that we found uh, in the 1800s, late 1800s in South Africa, uh, right near the town of Kimberley, uh, we thought initially that these diamonds were growing from the magma as xenocrysts, but after studying them for a few years, we learned that actually these uh, kimberlite pipes carry a lot of material up with them from great depths. And one of the things they carry is these nodules or xenoliths that are chunks of rock from the Earth's mantle. So here's a kind of green and red potato shown here. Um, this is one kind of rock, and here's another one. There's a slice of, of rock here called an eclogite, and this is sort of labeled as being diamond-studded ancient sea floor. Eclogite is kind of a high-pressure cooked or metamorphosed equivalent of what we think the basaltic ocean crust turns into when it's subducted into the earth. Now, we recognize that these pipes contain chunks of rock, these mantle xenoliths from a depth of maybe 150 to 200 kilometers. And some of the minerals that we see in these xenoliths are actually uh, sort of parroted or duplicated in the diamonds themselves when we look at inclusions sealed inside the diamond. So for instance, take this eclogite, it has this orange garnet and this blue kyanite in it. Well, sometimes we see diamonds like this that has an orange crystal of garnet and a blue kyanite in it. This is a diamond that would have grown inside a host rock corresponding to that xenolith, a host rock of eclogite at a depth of about 150 to 200 kilometers deep. And we've studied a lot of diamonds and their inclusions and our sort of understanding of where diamonds come from is largely built on this idea of inclusions and mantle xenoliths. So if we look at a collection of all kinds of diamonds that have been studied over the past few decades, this is a, a collection of almost 3000 diamonds and these are lithospheric diamonds. So they've come from a depth of maybe five or uh, 150 to 200 kilometers in the thickest parts and oldest parts of cratons. And by looking at the inclusions within them, we think that maybe about a third of these diamonds grow in a host rock that looks like eclogite, and maybe two thirds grow in a host rock that's peridotite. So this is rich in olivine and orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene. We can even break down this peridotitic component a little bit further and learn that actually many of these diamonds grow in uh, a very melt depleted peridotite that we could call Hartsburgite. Now this covers about 98, maybe even 99% of the diamonds we mine. We think they come from the Earth's lithosphere, the continental lithosphere, but that's not all diamonds. Sometimes we have diamonds like this that contain inclusions that don't fit into that realm. This is a, a kind of pretty iridescent inclusion of a mineral called ferropericlase. And this, when recognized in tandem with some other minerals, we can infer has come from a, a much greater depth, a totally different environment. And we can compare these minerals with rocks that we've put in a press and done experiments in to see what rocks turn into at high pressures and high temperatures. So what I mean is shown on, on this diagram here. So we've taken those two main rock types, uh, peridotite and an eclogite, which is here labeled as basalt. And these are sort of the composition of those rocks, but we've been able to change them by heating them up and exerting pressure on them to see how, they, uh, how their mineralogy changes. So at a depth uh, shallower than about 200 kilometers, we can see, for instance, this eclogite is made up of garnet and clinopyroxene. 
But if we were to take that rock down deeper into the mantle, the minerals within it would change purely as a function of the pressure and temperature exerted on it. So if we go down deeper into the earth, this eclogite, uh, well, that clinopyroxene would slowly disappear uh, down in the mantle transition zone, deeper than about 400 kilometers here. The rock is almost dominated entirely by garnet that has more silica in it. It's a majoritic garnet. And if we go deeper still, we see that even that majoritic garnet disappears and we have new minerals appearing. So this is sort of the basis of understanding some of these higher pressure mineral inclusions in diamonds. And that inclusion I showed you on the last slide, that ferropericlase grain, well, that's something that we think comes from the lower mantle, especially if we're able to match it up with corresponding phases like a magnesium silicate phase called Bridgmanite down here and this calcium silicate phase that's in a perovskite crystal structure, this calcium silicate perovskite, which now has a new mineral name. It's called Dave Maoite. Uh, but this is sort of our roadmap uh, for looking at and interpreting uh, inclusions that we think come from below the lithosphere, sublithospheric diamonds, and we call these sometimes super deep diamonds. Now, We've learned a lot about diamonds from studying their inclusions. And one big thing that we know is that there are multiple different kinds of diamonds out there. So there are diamonds, like we said, maybe the majority of them, 98% or more, formed in the base of old and thick parts of continents in what we might call the cratonic keel. So a lot of the diamonds grown here between about 150 to 200 kilometers are growing in host rocks that are peridotitic. And we also see these little lenses of orange here and there, and that's representing eclogite. So this is most of the diamonds that we mine. But here and there, we've recognized in the past few decades that sometimes diamonds have these higher pressure inclusions that suggest that they've come from greater depths, from below the lithosphere, their sublithospheric or super deep diamonds. Now, what does this have to do with the Earth's finest diamonds? Well, we'll get there. Um, let's first have a, a sort of think about this idea that there are multiple different kinds of diamonds out there. When we look at diamonds in jewelry, uh, they all kind of look uh, sparkly and beautiful, and they all kind of are lumped together into one big mess. So let's look at a large data set like that that's come through uh, GIA, which is a, a place where diamonds are graded the Gemological Institute of America. I've got a sample set here of three and a half million diamonds and they've been divided up based on size. So anyone who doesn't know a carat, one carat is 0.2 grams. So uh, once you get up above one or two carats, these are fairly large diamonds for most people. So we've got these diamonds divided up into different size categories and they've been sorted into different colors. So this is the sort of grading scale for colors. Uh, when you're talking about colorless to near colorless diamonds, they're put in this alphabet. So it starts at D, A, B, and C are not used. So D is the perfectly colorless diamond. And then as we go through the alphabet, we start to see a little bit of yellowish or brownish color. So these diamonds have been sorted in terms of this classification of color. And this requires an expert and a grading set to sort of match up where the color of any given stone lies. What I'd like you to see is that there's a distribution of colors. So here it's centered around about F color. And as we look at larger and larger diamonds, this hump uh, starts to shift outwards towards more colorful regions. So we get uh, out towards G and then towards H colors. And this makes sense because there's a longer path length for the light going through these larger diamonds. So we would expect more light to be absorbed and any color that's sort of present in this whole population of diamonds would be more pronounced in larger diamonds. But let's look at some diamonds beyond three carats. So if we look at uh, say five to 10 carats, well, we can see that hump has shifted even farther to the right, uh, but there's a little bit of a blip growing here around D color. And if we go to 10 to 20 carats or even very large diamonds above 20 carats, 
this proportion, this little blip at D color has actually exploded. And for some reason we have a preponderance of diamonds in the larger categories that are perfectly colorless. And just in this data set, that suggests that when you're looking at the larger diamonds, maybe there's a, a population of diamonds in there that's actually a bit different. It's not just a bigger version of the sort of regular lithospheric diamonds we're used to looking at. Maybe there's something different about it. So if we actually dug into the data and found out what these diamonds look like, these large colorless diamonds, this is what that material is. So these are rough diamonds now. And this is a collection of diamonds from the Letseng mine in Lesotho, which is particularly known for producing these diamonds that reach into larger sizes and perfectly colorless ranges. So these diamonds uh, would probably end up being cut and polished into perfectly colorless D color diamonds. But in the rough state, we can see that they're sort of very irregular in their morphology. Their surface textures are very resorbed. These are kind of unusual characteristics. A lot of diamonds tend to have some kind of crystal forms to them. But when you start looking at these ones, uh, their morphology is distinctly different. Also, as we saw in the last slide, these diamonds seem to dominate the larger size fraction. So as a population, these diamonds have a larger average size and it's not unusual for them to reach hundreds of carats or even break over a thousand carats. And when we look in them, these diamonds are actually very inclusion poor. So they're very clean inside. And there's a bit of a kicker here because even when they do have inclusions, the rare examples with inclusions are often sort of cleaned up and those things are polished away when they're manufactured into faceted gemstones. So when they're cut in polished forms, diamonds like these often have no inclusions to speak of. So what are these? Well, they've been given a name by me because they needed a name. Uh, so I've named them uh, according to an acronym that describes their key physical characteristics. And this name is Clipper. So this is sort of hinged on a type example. The best example of diamonds in this category is the Cullinan diamond shown here on a stick. And this is the largest gem diamond ever found. It was 3,106 carats. So diamonds that are like this are generally large, they're inclusion poor, they're very pure chemically, so they're usually type 2A, which means that they don't have any nitrogen in their crystal structure, so they're very pure carbon. And in their morphology, as we saw in the rough state, they're irregular and resorbed, which also sets them apart from a lot of other kinds of diamonds. So these diamonds really stand out. Now, I said that they're inclusion poor, not inclusion free. Now, if we look at a historical image of the Cullinan diamond itself, we can see it had some inclusions in it, these little black things here. They look like black flakes. And a more recent uh, diamond that was mined just a few years ago is the Lesotho legend was 910 carats. And it also has some of these black uh, round looking inclusions in it. And it looks like a thin blade or a flake and for many years, these were assumed to be flakes of graphite. Uh, graphite's made of carbon, the diamond's made of carbon. It's not that unusual that diamonds have some inclusions of uh, graphite within them. So that's a reasonable explanation. But the problem is that no one's really been able to get a hold of these diamonds and break them apart and study these things in great detail. So even when you do find inclusions like these, it's very frustrating that no one's really had the chance to systematically research them. Now, related to these clipper diamonds and also containing some uh, little black inclusions like these are type 2B diamonds. So these have a similar kind of morphology. They're found at some of the same deposits and they're also very pure chemically. So they have no nitrogen in them, but these ones are distinguished by a small hint of boron. So they have a little bit of boron in the crystal lattice and that can give them this blue color. This is a collection of five beautiful blue diamonds that were sold recently. These are from the Cullinan mine, which is probably the most uh, famous uh, locality in recent history that produces blue diamonds reliably. So these are the two 
categories or varieties of diamonds that we're going to be talking about. They're closely related, but they're distinguished by boron here. So we've got clipper diamonds and we've got type 2b diamonds like the hope. And these really are the world's finest diamonds, these categories, but they're enigmatic because we haven't had the chance to study their inclusions in detail and make them fit into that sort of geological context that we're familiar with. So there are a couple problems here. One, these diamonds are extremely valuable as gemstones. You can't buy them and it's unlikely they're gonna be donated for research. And even if they were lent to you for research, both of these diamonds are completely flawless. So we have that problem that the inclusions are extremely rare. And these two factors combined have really hindered any kind of insight into these diamond varieties for many, many years. So how we actually fit them into this picture of sort of diamonds in the mantle has been a huge question. And this is actually the reason why I went to GIA. So I came to GIA as a postdoc. Uh, they're still accepting postdocs, so you can apply there now if you want to investigate a problem in uh, gem geology or, or material science related to gemology. Uh, but I went there to look for inclusions in diamonds like these. And the advantage for me being there was that I could harness the, the sort of grading operations, see this river of diamonds passing through GIA for grading. So if you want to see rare and unusual diamonds, it's great to be in a place where there are sort of millions of diamonds in this endless stream. So I was able to, over the course of several years, pick out inclusion bearing diamonds that sort of fit these characteristics. And the samples I've looked at have been screened from hundreds of thousands of diamonds. So this is something that you really couldn't accomplish um, anywhere else in the world. I was also fortunate to be able to obtain some off cuts. So pieces of diamond like this one at the bottom that have been trimmed off of larger diamonds during the manufacturing of cut and polish gemstones. So here I'm going to be talking about a story that's sort of built on examining 83 clipper diamonds and 46 type 2b diamonds, plus a few more in the past couple years that I'll throw in there. And the, the stories for both categories are consistent. Um, so the methods I've been using to examine these inclusions, mostly I've been relying on Raman spectroscopy because it's a technique where you can sort of take a cut and polish diamond like this um, try to identify some of these inclusions non-destructively and then be able to give that diamond back to the client, you know, hours later or the next day. So it's a quick and non-destructive technique that's very powerful if you've got high value goods like this that you're not really allowed to cut up and destroy. I was also able to use some X-ray diffraction and electron microprobe and SEM and EDS to examine inclusions in some of these offcuts where I was able to polish down or cut these and expose a cross section through some of these inclusions to examine them in more detail. So let's talk about what, uh, what I found. So we'll begin with these clipper diamonds and their inclusions. So there's a range of them, 23, that contain uh, majoritic garnet. And we saw that a few slides ago. This is a high pressure uh, mineral that occurs below the Earth's lithosphere. And I also found examples of uh, calcium silicate phase that we infer to be calcium silicate perovskite. So these are minerals that only form at extreme pressures. And it means immediately that these diamonds aren't part of that 98%. They're not part of that lithospheric diamond package. These are something that have formed deeper in the earth. And in fact, these have been derived probably from around 360 to 750 kilometers deep in the earth. So clipper diamonds, surprisingly, aren't just big versions of all the regular diamonds. They're actually a, a totally different kind of population. They're super deep diamonds formed very deep in the earth. This is a few images of what these inclusions look like. Uh, it's quite often that they have this sort of black graphitic flake like looking fracture around them. And the inclusion itself is much smaller and, and is hard to see without the aid of magnification. 
So I'd like to show you one uh, particular special diamond that I got to examine uh, last year before, before everyone was sort of banned from traveling. I had the opportunity to examine this just at the beginning of last year. This is a clipper diamond from Letseng. So it's from one of these classic localities that produces a lot of diamonds like this. Now this one's a little bit fractured and included, uh, but it's still part of this uh, characteristically large family with this irregular uh, morphology and resorbed surface textures. It just happens to have some more fractures in it that obscure its clarity. Now this diamond, I was actually able to see some inclusions just below surface and through the, the rough surface of the diamond, as I, I was able to uh, identify some of these inclusions using Raman spectroscopy. So here is that uh, sort of cluster of inclusions that I mean. So there are nine little tiny inclusions here pointed out and we're seeing them through a rough surface. So that's why you can't see them very clearly, but it's enough that I could focus this uh, laser on them and identify them using Raman spectroscopy. And collectively, we see a few different minerals represented here, orthopyroxene, spinel, jeffmanite, and these would have originally all been one single phase, a magnesium silicate with aluminum dissolved in it that corresponds to uh, this magnesium silicate perovskite, which is uh, bridgmanite. So this is bridgmanite that has broken down. As the diamond has come to surface, it breaks down to lower pressure minerals because bridgmanite's no longer stable. And this is something that happens to most of these inclusions. They invert or retrogress to lower pressure minerals. And it's sort of like a detective case where you have to piece together these bits of information and decide whether this uh, sort of assemblage of minerals actually represents a higher pressure mineral phase. Now, a lot of these minerals also have a very high remnant pressure in them. So that's a, another clue that these are actually something derived from higher pressures. So if we take these mineralogical observations and go back to this roadmap of ours and try to place these inclusions that we've seen onto this diagram, it looks like this. So we saw uh, some examples of majoritic garnet. So that's this high pressure garnet that contains a sort of excess silica. So that's something we don't really see until we hit the, the mantle transition zone down here. We also see examples of this calcium silicate phase shown here in yellow. Now this is restricted to the mantle transition zone if you're just talking about these compositions, but if you allow the rock composition to vary a little bit and you're really strict about the lower depth limit, this mineral uh, as calcium silicate perovskite could be trapped as shallow as 360 kilometers. So that's the sort of the basis of the, the upper limit here on our observations. But then we've also got diamonds like that last one, that walnut sized diamond I showed you in this slide. So this diamond with its former bridgmanite gives us at least one example from a classic locality that looks like it's really coming from the lower mantle. So overall, we can say that these clipper diamonds have silicate inclusions that tell us they come from the transition zone to lower mantle depths. So that in itself is kind of an incredible observation but that's not most of the inclusions in these diamonds. In fact, the most common inclusion in these clipper diamonds is something very strange. It's this, these are metallic inclusions. So here we can see this black graphitic fracture around this inclusion. The actual volumetric nucleus, the inclusion itself is this bar shaped thing here. It's very reflective and metallic in its luster but it's also metallic in its composition. And this is very rich in metallic iron actually. And this inclusion, uh, when they're large enough like this one will actually attract a magnet, which is very bizarre. This is the first time I've seen anything like this in natural diamonds. And so I've got in the next slide, a cross section through an inclusion like this. So we can see what it looks like inside. And we can see that it's multiple phases here. So this inclusion is this bright green phase, which is an iron carbide phase called coenite. This turquoise phase here is an iron sulfide. And then this sort of pink uh, modeled phase here and there, that's where the nickel is hiding. This is an iron nickel alloy. 
So this inclusion is a mixture of iron, nickel, carbon, and sulfur. And if you actually brought this back down into the mantle at high temperatures, this would actually be a melt. So this is a melt inclusion, a metallic melt inclusion. And because it has such a, an ability to dissolve carbon, we think that this actually represents the growth medium for these diamonds. We think that clipper diamonds have grown from a metallic melt that has been trapped in some cases. And this is what these inclusions are showing us. They're showing us a little sample of the diamond growth medium, which is this metallic melt rich in iron and nickel. Now, I, I did have an interpretation about this, but I'll hold off for now. Um, and we'll revisit the interpretation after we talk about type 2b diamonds. So remember, these are the cousins to the clipper diamonds. They're found in a lot of the same locations around the world. They're a bit more rare, uh, but the places where we find a lot of clipper diamonds, we tend to find a pronounced abundance of type 2b diamonds as well. So for instance, the Hope Diamond, it came from India, from the Golconda mines, which were a historic place for finding a lot of clipper diamonds as well, like the Kohinoor, which was a, a very large, uh, beautiful D color, flawless diamond. That's one of these great examples of a clipper diamond. So these diamonds are similar to clipper diamonds, but they're characterized by the presence of boron. Boron can be present in amounts as low as 0.01 ppm and as high as a few ppm, meaning parts per million. So the diamond is still mostly carbon, but just having a little bit of boron in there um, is enough to give it a blue color sometimes. So these diamonds can be uh, beautiful blue colors. And a perfect example is the Hope Diamond, which again came from uh, the famous Golconda locality in India. Today, a lot of the blue diamonds that we have come from the Cullinan mine in South Africa. But there are other places around the world where type 2b diamonds have been found. Now, from a geological perspective, type 2b diamonds are kind of strange because of the boron. So boron is an element that's very strongly enriched at Earth's surface. So boron partitions very strongly into any kind of magma that rises from the Earth's mantle up to the Earth's surface. So boron is enriched up to the surface. And then any kind of water that circulates in the Earth's surface will re-enrich uh, boron right up to the, the surface of the Earth. And the deposits that we mine for boron are actually evaporite deposits where water has sort of scavenged boron and brought it to the surface of the earth. And then that water is evaporated away, leaving borax. Borax is the mineral that we mine for, um, for boron. It's, uh, that's where boron is at the earth's surface. And there's very little boron in the mantle. It's there, but it's sort of scarce. So it's unusual that we have this particular variety of diamonds that's characterized by boron. It's kind of like a big exclamation mark on these diamonds that we haven't been able to explain. So the inclusions hopefully can give us a, a bit of insight here. So again, uh, using sort of the power of this stream of diamonds coming through GIA for grading, over the course of a couple of years, I was able to screen through more than a thousand type 2B diamonds to find those rare examples that have inclusions in them. So here's a collection of um, inclusion bearing type 2b diamonds that were published in uh, a paper in 2018. And since then, I've looked at a few more inclusions that are consistent with the ones that I've seen in these. So let me just show you what some of these inclusions look like. There are a couple of features I want you to see. So first off, uh, inclusions like this one we can see this sort of clear phase. It's got some topography and like little cracks around it, but it's also got this black material here. So this inclusion is actually multiple phases all kind of coexisting. This clear phase here is orthopyroxene and this darker phase here is a spinel phase. And if you were to bring this back down into the mantle, you could make this go sort of back together um, so right now it's separated like oil and water, but you could re-homogenize it 
uh, into its original delicious salad dressing, which was uh, magnesium silicate perovskite. So this was trapped as a single phase originally, and now has retrogressed into multiple phases that need to be interpreted in terms of uh, sort of collection. The other thing I wanna point out is that you'll notice sometimes we've got inclusions like this that are surrounded by lots of little tiny inclusions that kind of form a lobe uh, around one of these inclusions. Here's another one that's surrounded by these uh, little tiny inclusions. And these inclusions are all coexisting along a little tiny plane. So this is actually a little tiny fracture. The diamond has actually broken apart momentarily and the material from this inclusion has actually sprayed out or exploded out into this fracture. And then once that fracture is opened up, the pressure inside this inclusion has dropped back down dramatically and the diamond has healed back up. So the, the sort of space in between all these little droplets is optically continuous and healed as diamond. So this is something that I would attribute to the fact that a lot of these high pressure minerals actually expand when they invert to lower pressure minerals. So for instance, this calcium silicate phase as a calcium silicate perovskite, um, it's a much more compact crystal structure. And when this inverts to the lower pressure phase, which is a brayite, it actually expands by about 30%. So uh, this can be accommodated, this big volume change can be accommodated by sort of rupturing the surrounding diamond and then injecting material out into it. So I think that's just kind of an interesting textural observation that corroborates the idea that these are high pressure um, phases that have been trapped inside the diamonds. So let's look at uh, a large diamond. This is the largest type 2B diamond that I examined. It's from the Cullinan mine, which is this classic locality for type 2B diamonds. And this diamond's called the Cullinan Dream. You can actually see a particularly large inclusion in it right here. Now, I didn't get to examine the rough. I got to examine it when it was uh, cut. This is the largest diamond that was cut from this piece. It was 24 carats and it was sold for $25 million. But for a couple hours, it was mine. And I got to examine the inclusions in it. Surprisingly enough, this one was actually cut and polished and some inclusions were preserved within it because for the case like this, where you're dealing with a fancy color diamond, sometimes it makes sense to forego getting a flawless grade if you can get a diamond that's large and a very beautiful color like this. So this is a fancy intense blue diamond and it's fetched a very high price, despite the fact that it has these inclusions in it. So I was very happy to see this diamond because it has this perfectly polished face in it. It's exactly what I want to be able to examine the interior through the microscope and actually be able to examine these with Raman spectroscopy. So I could shine the laser on this and discover that this is this calcium silicate phase that we infer to be calcium silicate perovskite which is actually fairly common. This is the most common mineral phase that I found in type 2B diamonds. Let's look at another large example. So this is something that I saw uh, recently, just last year, at the beginning of last year, a 20 karat diamond, again, from the Cullinan mine. And this one, uh, you can see one particularly large inclusion through the rough surface. You can just kind of make out this uh, blackish region here. And through the microscope, we can actually see a couple inclusions. So here's a crystal surrounded by this black graphitic fracture. And here's another one here. And I was able to focus the laser on these and do Raman spectroscopy again. And these are both uh, this magnesium silicate orthopyroxene that I interpret to be former Bridgmanite. So at high pressures and temperatures down in the mantle, this inclusion was originally trapped as Bridgmanite which remember is that magnesium silicate perovskite phase of the lower mantle. So let's go back to our roadmap again, and we can plot up some of these inclusions that we've seen. So that calcium silicate phase, that's that yellow field here. This is something that we think uh, is found in the mantle transition zone and below. 
Uh, we've got some examples of former Bridgmanite, which is dominated by magnesium silicate. We've got a few examples of ferropericlase. Um, I didn't show you anything like this yet, but this is a high pressure version of quartz. This is actually coasite. And even that isn't the original high pressure form. This was initially trapped as stichovite, which is a really high pressure version of quartz. And the other phase I wanna point out is this down here, it's labeled CF. This is the calcium ferrite type phase. So that just refers to its original crystal structure. But this is a phase that's rich in sodium and aluminum. And now uh, the inclusion that we see is dominated by nepheline and spinel. So the whole collection of inclusions that we've seen across this almost 50 type 2B diamonds gives us a picture that the inclusions reflect sort of basaltic or eclogitic and peridotitic bulk compositions at a depth that corresponds to the lower mantle and possibly also the transition zone. So we're talking about this sort of depth region here. And this could be interpreted as together, the, the collection of eclogite or basalt plus peridotite at these depths, this could be interpreted as oceanic lithosphere. Uh, so like a ocean, ocean tectonic plate that's been subducted down deep into the earth. And we have the crust and mantle portions of that package of rock. The crust of the ocean lithosphere is basaltic in composition and the mantle portion of that slab is peridotitic. And that immediately gives us uh, an option for where this boron might be coming from. The boron could actually be derived from the Earth's surface and it could have been carried down deep into the mantle. So this could be surface derived boron. And that's an inference based on the inclusion mineralogy, but it's actually supported now by some preliminary boron isotope measurements that I won't speak to in detail, but were presented uh, at a Goldschmidt conference a couple of years ago are, and are continuing to be developed into a, a paper now. Not by me, but by a research group at the University of Alberta. So how does this boron actually get into the slab? Well, the oceanic slab is overlain by ocean water. And at the bottom of the ocean, we have a lot of interaction between the seawater and the ocean floor beneath. We have hydrothermal alteration. So we can see this in some places as hydrothermal vents like black smokers. We can see hot mineral rich water sort of spewing out of the ocean floor. But if we could look down below this, uh, what we would see is rocks that have sort of been altered by interaction with seawater. And this is something that is uh, extremely variable from place to place, but there are some regions where there's a lot of this activity, some regions where there's less, and the extent of it is difficult to ascertain because it's so variable. But a few different uh, important tectonic locations where we see a lot of serpentinization of the seafloor are the mid-ocean ridge, transform faults moving away from the ocean ridge, and one of my favorites, these faults related to the bending of this oceanic slab before it gets subducted down into the mantle. So while this slab is being bent, there are these big cracks sort of uh, radiating into that slab, allowing seawater to penetrate deeply into the slab and react with it. So these are all sites of seafloor serpentinization. Uh, that could affect the slab that's being injected or subducted down into the mantle. Now connecting this idea of serpentinization with diamond formation isn't my idea. Uh, actually 10 years ago Ben Hart uh, put out this idea. So he's got uh, a diagram here showing uh, serpentinites in the form of uh, this is the mineral antigorite. So this is a major serpentine mineral that's a magnesium silicate that's hydrous. And he's demonstrating that actually, if you had a slab that was kind of cold, a cold slab, the interior that's serpentinized could actually make it from the antigorite stability field into the field that's labeled here, dense hydrous magnesium silicates. So it could retain some of its water budget without really heating up and dewatering or dehydrating. It's possible for a cold slab 
to have its interior serpentinite budget uh, kind of maintained to greater depths. And if it were maintained to greater depths, as this slab gets deeper and deeper, we might have some sort of pronounced locations where we expect that slab to heat up and go to higher temperatures. And we see uh, sort of pronounced horizons of the slab heating up and dehydrating and it sort of expels a budget of fluid. And that could be the trigger for diamond growth at certain depths. So that fits very nicely with the story of type 2b diamonds because we think that this budget of serpentinite could actually be the carrier for boron. So imagine these diamonds forming here and getting a, a hit of boron. So this is what we've adopted in our model for type 2b diamond genesis, where seawater uh, sort of puts boron into serpentinite, and then this material can be subducted and finally release its budget of hydrous fluid and boron, which is sort of incorporated into these type 2b diamonds. These diamonds are then incorporated into some kind of upwelling activity that we don't fully understand, but their eventual appearance at surface is aided by a kimberlite eruption. And then we find them and we cherish them as these beautiful blue diamonds. Now, the whole involvement of hydrous fluid in that story might actually be corroborated by some of these inclusions. If we look at some of these inclusions, like these two here, uh, we can see that they're not just that solid uh, calcium silicate or magnesium silicate phase. Actually, in Raman spectroscopy, we can see a kick for methane or a kick for hydrogen. These solid inclusions actually have a thin jacket of fluid around them. And this is something I've seen in type 2b diamonds and many, many clipper diamonds that have this budget of methane plus or minus molecular hydrogen. It suggests that these inclusions contained hydrogen. That hydrogen has since sort of migrated out of the solid inclusion as it's come to surface because the pressure is lower. It can't fit into that inclusion crystal structure anymore. And as it sort of builds up at the periphery of this inclusion, well, it can react with the carbon of the diamond itself and form methane. So this budget of hydrogen in these inclusions suggests that the diamond formation uh, might have involved some kind of a hydrous fluid. And the breakdown of water bearing minerals could potentially provide such a hydrous fluid and provide boron that might explain these type 2b diamonds. So now that we've talked about uh, serpentinite and how it might relate to type 2b diamonds, let's go back to those metallic inclusions. So remember, they're a mixture of iron, nickel, carbon, and sulfur. Now, experiments in theory have predicted that there should be some amount of metallic iron deep in the mantle due to this phenomenon of iron disproportionation. So due to the effect of increasing pressure on minerals like garnet, we expect to see some uh, metallic iron precipitating purely as a function of pressure. This is something you can do in the laboratory just by taking uh, some of these rocks, even basalt, if you squeeze it to high enough pressures, you start to see metallic iron precipitating. This is something we expect to be occurring below a depth of about 250 kilometers. And initially, uh, when we discovered these metallic inclusions, this was the only realistic mechanism to explain the metal that we're seeing. So we figure that clipper diamonds may provide physical evidence of this phenomenon of iron disproportionation and sort of iron uh, saturation in the mantle purely because of mineral physics and pressure. But when we look in detail at clipper diamonds and we recognize that they're actually sort of associated with subducted lithologies, they're sort of cousins to these type 2b diamonds that we also know are associated with subducted lithologies. And we recognize that the carbon isotopes in these diamonds form a whole range from very light up to heavier values. And these carbon isotope values we associate with surficial carbon that might be uh, organic or inorganic, but that's uh, sort of um, uh, potentially like methane or something like that. We, we associate this kind of uh, range of light isotopic signatures with carbon that's derived from surface. The question comes, well, could the metal itself be 
subducted? Could this metal form somehow from serpentinization? Could it be part of this serpentinite story? And I think the answer is maybe. And I'm just going to allude to this here. But so the idea is that serpentinization very crudely and loosely is a reaction where water uh, interacts with olivine and orthopyroxene in peridotite. And we get a variety of different reactions, but just sort of as a, a bulk observation, we see, serpent, we see serpentine, brucite, uh, often magnetite, and we see molecular hydrogen evolving in this system that's sort of uh, creating a very high hydrogen fugacity to the point where metal can be precipitated. It's not unusual for serpentinites to have disseminated little grains of nickel iron alloy. And in some cases, we can even see large nuggets of iron nickel alloy. This nugget is from an ophiolite in Josephine County, Oregon. And this nugget is about two centimeters large. Um, but this is sort of an unusual occurrence, but maybe it's not that unusual. After all, we've got places like these deep um, deep reaching bending related faults where we know we have serpentinization reaching uh, several kilometers down past the oceanic crust down into the, the mantle portion of the slab here. And we don't have a full understanding of how much serpentinite is formed here and what it exactly looks like in terms of its mineralogical style. So I like to keep an open mind and maybe this is an environment where metal is forming and maybe the metal that we're seeing in clipper diamonds could have been produced during serpentinization. I think it's a, a valid option to explore. So if we put both of these diamonds, uh, clipper diamonds and type 2b diamonds back together and try to draw a picture of what they look like, this is what I think we're dealing with. So we've got, remember our, our very common diamonds formed at the base of the continental lithosphere. These uh, clipper and type 2b diamonds appear to be intimately associated with a subducted oceanic slab. We've got the presence of metal whose origin is still not quite fully explained. And in this setting, the slab itself uh, can release a couple different fluids or melts, one associated with carbonatites or carbonate melting out of the ocean crust, altered ocean crust. And the other might be a hydrous fluid that's released by serpentine or serpentinites that are in the mantle portion of this subducting slab. So maybe uh, both of these are kind of triggers for uh, diamond formation. Maybe these mechanisms contribute to what we're seeing down here. Now, if we back off a second here and just think about the earth as a whole, um, as geologists, I mean, we're used to living our lives at the surface of the earth, and there are many visually striking uh, observations we can make of material coming out of the earth, such as this beautiful volcano here. Uh, but it's a little bit more difficult to imagine what is going into the earth. And since the 1960s, when we've sort of developed our ideas of plate tectonics, we've come to understand that a lot of this material, the ocean floor, is sort of the main thing that's being injected back into the earth. And when we're talking about what this might carry with it, we're often thinking about uh, sediments that are resting on the slab, or we're talking about altered oceanic crust. Uh, and we're really focused on the sort of arc system here, the subduction factory, and trying to figure out what goes down and what's coming up in these volcanoes in this arc setting. Uh, and it's not unusual to sort of draw a fading off dot, dot, dot line down here. We don't really know what happens to the slab, but I'd like to uh, sort of offer up that maybe we have uh, diamonds that are telling us about a second subduction factory in a sense. So we've got the sort of shallow classical subduction factory up here but just as important when we're thinking about recycling into the earth, it's not just about those sediments or altered oceanic crust, that maybe uh, sort of the idea of recycling, we need to be thinking about what's happening down here as we enter the lower mantle. And a big part of this system might be recorded in some of the, the diamonds that we see, these clipper diamonds and type 2b diamonds. They might be telling us this story of what happens in the deeper interior parts of the slab that kind of bypass the arc setting. So 
I think that's all I've got to say here. So clipper diamonds and type 2b diamonds are super deep diamonds or sublithospheric diamonds. And we think based on their inclusions that they come from the transition zone to the uppermost lower mantle. So somewhere within this depth range. And it's important to, to sort of recognize that these aren't just big versions of regular diamonds or blue versions of regular diamonds, that these have actually formed by a completely different genetic model. And they might be telling us about the sort of activity of the subducting slab that as it enters the transition zone and lower mantle, and that it might have some activity of melts and fluids that represent a subduction factory that makes diamonds. And now we know in this environment, we have pockets of metallic melt that are the most common inclusions that we see in clipper diamonds. And based on what we've seen in type 2b diamonds, it seems that there's some kind of relationship here with deeply subducted serpentinized oceanic slabs. And I think this last part is really the most important that this um, sort of expression of diamonds could be illustrating, it could be a physical sample of what is really a major geochemical pathway for halogens, for boron, and for water into the Earth's interior. And with that, I'd like to take some questions. Thank you, Evan, um, for sharing your fascinating research with us tonight. You certainly did not disappoint. Um, I've been personally repeatedly impressed by how rapidly uh, magmas are thought to ascend from Earth's mantle to erupt on the surface of these so-called, or you know, the so-called um, highway from hell, right? Are there any estimates for how long it takes for these super deep diamonds to come back up from depth? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, and, and the answer is kind of disappointing or intriguing, depending on who you ask. The, the answer is we don't really have a great understanding of how these diamonds get from, say, the lower mantle or the transition zone up to shallower depths. And we know the last part of that journey up to surface happens in the kimberlite or related volcanic pipe. And we think that that last volcanic part of the journey takes maybe hours or days, something like that. So it's very, very quick. But the, the previous, the first leg of that journey, maybe say from 500 or 600 kilometers all the way up to 200 kilometers, we're not sure if that's related to this volcanism or if that's more of a passive upwelling that might potentially take millions of years. This is an open question and it might uh, require us to finally get some dating done on these inclusions before we'll know that answer. So right now we don't have a firm understanding of how old some of these diamonds are compared to the volcanic eruptions that we see them in at surface. Thank you very much. And I know that many of you out there have questions for our speaker. Please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And note that we appreciate all of your questions, but please be advised that due to the limited time, we may not be able to answer all of them. We'll do our very best to get through as many of them as we can tonight. And Evan has said that he's willing to hang around and answer as many as he can. Um, we're trying to, we will try to group similar questions together whenever possible. Uh, so uh, first question from Gregory Kazakoff. So you talk about these um, special diamonds, these super deep diamonds, but what kind of diamonds specifically occur here in Canada? So, so in Canada, we've got uh, a few diamond mines in up north, up north of Yellowknife. We've got Diavik and Akati. We've also got Gacho Quay. There's the closed Snap Lake. And then in Ontario, there's the Victor Mine. In Quebec, there's the Renard Mine. And for the most part, I think these diamonds are lithospheric, kind of the, the normal suspects that we're used to dealing with. There are some examples of super deep diamonds, uh, but I haven't seen as many examples from these localities of what I would consider clipper diamonds or type 2b diamonds. I'm not aware of any type 2b diamonds from uh, anywhere in North America or even from Russia. Uh, but as far as clipper diamonds go, which overall in the grand scheme of things are more abundant than type 2b diamonds, these clipper diamonds, I've seen at least one good example from the, clip, from the Victor mine in Ontario that is over 100 carats that I, I would consider 
um, to fit into this family. And there's also a couple examples from, uh, from the Akati mine and from Dyavik. Uh, for instance, the Akati spirit diamond is one that was uh, in the news. And that's, I believe, uh, one of these type two diamonds that's large and very clean and very good color. So I think we do have some concrete examples of clipper diamonds in North America, but for some reason, they seem to be uh, less in number. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so the next question is from Scott Jess. Uh, he says, he really enjoyed the talk, but he's curious, and I, I think as am I, to the procurement and analysis uh, of the diamonds that you work with, how does the process work? Like, how do you get this river of diamonds and you know what happens? Yeah, so I, I should probably explain what the GIA is. The Gemological Institute of America is a nonprofit organization. And the main thing that they do is grade diamonds as a sort of independent third party. When people go to buy diamond jewelry, quite often they'll be looking to get a certificate with it that says, yes, it is this cut clarity, color and carat weight and sort of be a, an authority to vouch for those characteristics as a third party. So the GIA is sort of the world's largest provider of that service and, and they provide certificates, they grade diamonds. And that means that diamonds are constantly being submitted to the GIA and they have laboratories around the world and they're constantly receiving diamonds and grading them and sending them back to clients. And this means that there's a period of time when these diamonds are circulating through the laboratory and a variety of scientists are looking at them, scrutinizing them. And it's during this time that I was able to sort of borrow them and uh, you know, getting the right permission, of course, it's not a huge delay, but it is a slight delay sometimes, but being able to borrow them even for a couple hours to examine the inclusions visually, to take some pictures and to examine them using Raman spectroscopy before those diamonds get their certificate and go back out the door. So most of the samples that I've looked at have been sort of borrowed temporarily and they're cut and polished diamonds that are ready to be set in jewelry. Awesome, thank you very much. So the next question is from Thomas Gallagher, the namesake of the Gallagher Lecture Series. Um, carbonatites were mentioned in the talk. What is the part of the factory of, or the subduction factory system that relates to this carbonate? Yeah, so I think the, the carbonate part of that is probably uh, locked up in altered oceanic crust. Um, so at the sea floor, the ocean crust has water percolating through it and carbonate minerals like uh, dolomite and uh, or magnesite and calcite and dolomite could be precipitated in these rocks. So we've got carbonate minerals that are sort of precipitated in that package of solid rocks. And then when this rock heats up again, when it's subducted down into the earth, they can melt and produce a melt that's rich in sodium or calcium or magnesium carbonate. And that's what we mean by carbonatite. So it's probably mostly provided by uh, the ocean crust, but there could also be uh, carbonate within serpentinized packages of the mantle portion of the slab as well. So there could be carbonate melt coming from both of those regions. And a lot of that melt probably uh, comes out at shallower depths as well, but some of it could be preserved to greater depths. And in some of these super deep diamonds, we do actually get uh, little samples of carbonate minerals or sometimes even little droplets of carbonate melt. So it's something that we can actually see in the diamond. So we know for sure it's there. Great, thank you very much. Um, so the next question, I'm gonna just lump them together here from Alden, Alan Hildebrand in our department. So he asks first, how do the C12, C13 ratios compare for super deep diamonds versus shallow or lithospheric diamonds? And then have you been able to measure any of the sulfur isotope ratios in the metallic inclusions? Okay, so the, the carbon isotope ranges that we see in, in these diamonds is similar to what we see in eclogitic diamonds from the lithosphere. So uh, in clipper diamonds and type 2b diamonds, I've only analyzed a few for carbon isotopes, but they've shown a range from say minus uh, 27 per mil all the way up to minus three or four per mil. 
So it's sort of uh, going beyond the isotopic range we would expect to see for sort of mantle carbon, which is sitting at minus five, and it's expressing a broader range. And that broader range is something that we see in diamonds from the lithosphere as well, specifically the ones that are hosted in eclogite. So we see a range and the classical interpretation is that this range out to lighter isotopic values represents carbon that's derived from the Earth's surface. So that's what we see, but I think there's still room for uh, further interpretation into other mechanisms that might generate a range of carbon isotopes. And as far as the sulfur isotopes go, no, there hasn't been any uh, sulfur isotope analysis done on the sort of the sulfide portion of these metallic melt inclusions, but I think the results would be uh, valuable. So I think something like that is worth doing. The difficult part is just sort of getting together enough of these inclusions that you could use for a study like that. There are a lot of different things that we want to do, but we have a limited number of samples. So things really have to be prioritized quite stringently, but I think sulfur isotopes is definitely worth doing. Yeah, if only you can uh, measure sulfur isotopes via ramen, right? That'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, have any of the diamonds been age dated? Any of these super deep diamonds been age dated? I, I believe there's been one uh, uranium lead date on, on a single um, super deep diamond, but it wasn't one of these uh, clipper diamonds or type 2b diamonds. It was sort of the the regular range of super deep diamonds that people have known about for a couple decades now. So up until we recognize that these larger diamonds are actually super deep diamonds, previously it had been thought that all super deep diamonds were very small and never of gem quality. So the body of literature out there that's on super deep diamonds is mostly focused on those ones, especially from a classic locality, Juina in Brazil. And I think the age that we know of is from Juina. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I, th I think it's around uh, 90 million years. And I'm not quite sure how that compares with the age of the deposit itself. But I guess the real answer here is that, no, we don't have very good age control. We don't have very many measurements made on diamonds like these. And we don't know how much time there is between when they form and when they migrate up to surface and eventually appear in a volcanic eruption. Thank you for that. Uh, so a question from Margaret Emilia, which I think is a pretty interesting one. Do you think there's any way that pollutants or human activities could impact the inclusions that show up in these diamonds, right? Is there any way that's a spurious signal? If, if we could wait long enough, uh, do you mean, um, I, mean, I guess think about it both ways, right? So can we do something on the surface that can do that? But also, is there any way that, you know, the mining process has affected the, the inclusions? Yeah, okay. Those are both good questions. So uh, stuff that we do at the Earth's surface uh, might eventually make its way down into the Earth by these subducting tectonic plates, but it's going to take millions and millions of years. So there's no way we're ever going to see any kind of uh, impact of all of human history uh, represented in these diamonds. There's just too much time that's required. So you'd have to wait many, many millions of years for potentially new diamonds to form uh, that contain some kind of an artifact from human activity. Uh, the other part of the question I, I think is interesting. Um, could any of the material that we're seeing in these diamonds be like a contaminant? Could it be from mining or could it be from anything that we're doing in the lab? I mean, some of these diamonds receive from pretty harsh treatment. They can be cleaned up in uh, caustics or they can be treated with acid to, to sort of remove any surface contaminants. But the good thing about diamond is that it's almost chemically inert and it's very, very strong and rigid. So the inclusions that it contains are protected very, very well. And you can see that in some of the inclusions that I've examined here that have this little tiny bit of methane or hydrogen fluid surrounding the inclusion. That methane is under pressure, but it's sort of been very well contained. It's not allowed to leak out through the diamond crystal structure and it hasn't been leaking out through any kind of cracks that reach the surface. So a lot of the inclusions that we're able to examine are extremely well preserved and not 
contaminated by anything. If they were contaminated, we would be able to see it because they would look uh, bizarre. They would, they would have some kind of strange composition. Great, thank you very much. So I think continuing on that fluid theme that you were just mentioning there, I have two questions, one from Tom Gallagher and one from Dave Pattison, and I'll, I'll try to summarize them both as quickly as possible here. So the carbon source of the diamonds, is this, you know, is this a gas phase that, you know, ultimately contributes to crystallization? And then Dave Pattison is asking, how do these inclusions uh, described here relate to the so-called water-rich inclusions of ringwoodite in the, the diamonds described by Graham Pearson et al? Like, so the, I mean, I think the fluid story is very tantalizing here and I think everyone wants to know more. Yeah, so the, the carbon that's involved here is probably carbon that's dissolved either in a metallic melt, like I showed, that might contain a few weight percent carbon in it. And then if you change the chemistry of that melt, for instance, if you were to add oxygen to it or dissolve more sulfur into it, you could lower the solubility of carbon in that melt and cause carbon to precipitate. And you might say something similar about a hydrous or carbonatitic melt, that there's some kind of chemical change in the melt that causes carbon to precipitate or crystallize out of that melt or fluid. There's kind of a, a chemical impetus. Now, in terms of um, the, what was the second part of the question? It was about- uh, The ringwoodite and the- Ringwoodite, right. Yep. So there was a, a finding of a, a high pressure version of olivine called ringwoodite. So this is something we see in the mantle transition zone. And Graham Pearson found an inclusion of ringwoodite that had uh, water in it effectively. It had hydroxide in the crystal structure of the, the mineral ringwoodite itself. So, I mean, there's sort of been debate whether that hydrous fingerprint in the ringwoodite reflects the whole transition zone or whether it reflects some kind of localized hydration of ringwoodite during a diamond formation event. Um, I, I think that's still an open question, but um, in terms of the inclusions that I've seen here, I mean, it's possible that there is a similar hydroxyl component of water trapped in the crystal structure, but I haven't been able to, to do infrared spectroscopy on these inclusions to sort of pick at that uh, hydroxyl groups that might be in the crystal structure. The water, water or hydrogen that I've seen has sort of left the crystal structure, presumably because there's no crystallographic site left for it. So what I think has happened is that some of these mineral inclusions had some degree of hydrogen somewhere in their crystal lattice, and that has been forced out and migrated out of the solid phase entirely, and is just sitting around the periphery of that solid inclusion, and it can't go any farther. It can't escape the diamond. But in my opinion, that sort of hydrogen that we're seeing is probably something that was inherited from the diamond formation event, that that diamond forming fluid had some kind of watery component to it that was sort of dissolved into these minerals that are forming and being trapped in the inclusion. So the inclusions are potentially a little bit wet because of the diamond formation event. Yes, I love it. Deep earth water, aqueous geochemistry, high pressures is amazing. Um, so another couple of questions about the, the minerals. So do you ever see things like magnesium metal in these inclusions? I have not seen anything like a magnesium metal. No. Okay. Um, is it possible, this is from Tristan Glenn Morris, is it possible that kimberlites could be deeper seeded or is the latest thinking that kimberlites are limited to the lithosphere? Yeah, so the, the latest thinking is that kimberlites originate from slightly below the lithosphere, uh, but their actual depth of origin is just not fully known. We don't know what they sort of start out as or where they start out. We know that they evolve considerably during eruption and the sort of rock that we see erupting at surface isn't quite representative of what originated uh, down below. But we think that these eruptions originate from maybe 200 kilometers depth, but are probably coming from something deeper. But as they rise, how they evolve, when they actually become kind of explosive, uh, I think these are all open questions. Thank you. Um, so Arnold Anga asks, are other colored diamonds type 2B or clipper? So I guess that means other than 
blue, I suppose. I'm not sure. Well, there, there are a whole range of colored diamonds. There are yellow diamonds, pink diamonds, and they are not necessarily belonging to either one of these categories. So I talk mostly about perfectly colorless diamonds being part of this clipper category, but sometimes clipper diamonds can be pink or brown due to the effect of plastic deformation in the crystal structure. So this can generate vacancies that then start absorbing light. So we can see pink and brown colors in addition to colorless when it comes to clipper diamonds. And type 2B diamonds are often blue because of boron, but they can also be perfectly colorless if they don't have very much boron, or sometimes they can be brown or they can be gray due to the added effect of uh, plastic deformation that again adds vacancies and starts absorbing light. Uh, but when it comes to the whole range of other colors like green and yellow, um, most of those diamonds are part of that overarching big category of 99 or 98 percent of lithospheric diamonds. So those are sort of what I would call regular diamonds that formed from between 150 to 200 kilometers deep. Excellent, thank you. And we have a, a couple more questions, so we'll keep asking them. Herman Gruder asks, uh, what proportion of type one diamonds are low nitrogen given that most type two diamonds are low nitrogen? Yeah, I, I think that's kind of a tough one to answer definitively. Uh, it comes down to where you draw this line between type one and type two. So for anyone who's not familiar with this, this is a sort of a judgment you would make based on infrared absorption spectroscopy, looking for absorption due to nitrogen in the crystal structure. And the sort of cutoff, the detection limit for infrared spectroscopy could be between five, 10, or maybe even 20 parts per million. So it's kind of up to the instrument and the user as to where you draw the line between type one and type two. And then you get into this category of, well, it's maybe not type two, maybe it has some nitrogen in it, but it has a low degree of nitrogen in it. Um, I think it's very difficult to draw lines in there and there's overlap between all these different categories of diamonds. And I say clipper diamonds are sort of mostly type two, but we have seen a couple examples of diamonds that have all of these characteristics, even have some of these inclusions. They're large, perfectly colorless, um, but maybe they have uh, 20 ppm nitrogen in them. Um, so in that case, I think that diamond would still be categorized with its, its family, even though you can detect some nitrogen, I would still lump it with the clipper diamonds that overall are type two. Not sure if that really answers Herman's question. Well, I, I think that answered the question that it is it's fairly complicated to classify these things, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so Tom Gallagher has a question here. What is the resorption process in the diamonds that applies on the way up to the surface? So I think you said they, they mostly are resorbed, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, diamonds precipitate from a fluid or melt because the carbon supersaturation is raised above some, th some threshold. But if that... Uh, sort of solubility of carbon drops uh, and changes and, and raises back up and suddenly carbon is soluble again, uh, that's when diamonds will sort of be resorbed. And the big thing that happens to them is when they enter uh, sort of the kimberlite melt on their way to surface, this is a melt that's got lots of water and CO2 in it. And both of these volatiles are pretty good at sort of dissolving or resorbing or almost etching away the diamond. So it's actually like uh, dissolving little carbon atoms, taking them off the crystal structure one by one. And it takes carbon atoms from the corners and edges of the crystal first. And you can see a whole range of resorption expressed in some deposits from perfectly sharp octahedra and then those corners and edges get resorbed and kind of rounded away into a more uh, glossy resorbed looking form that we would call a dodecahedroid. Great, thank you. And so we have time for just one last question. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, is there a clear source for these diamonds? Can they be geographically linked to present or past subduction zones? And that I think might involve some speculation, but a very interesting question nonetheless. 
Yeah, that, that is a good question. Part of the problem here is that we're not quite sure how old these diamonds are. So to place them within space, if we were trying to recreate where, for instance, the diamonds from the Cullinan mine or from Letseng, um, where those diamonds were when they formed, we need to have some kind of temporal information. So let's say, for instance, is about 90 million years old and it contains some of these clipper diamonds, but we don't know if they were, these diamonds were formed, you know, close to 90 million years ago, or if they were formed a billion years ago. And in fact, many diamonds are billions of years old. It's not unusual to have diamonds that are upwards of three and a half billion years old. So you've got almost all of Earth's history to try to trace the whereabouts of these diamonds. So I think to try to track back um, an origin for some of these diamonds in terms of plate tectonics, we really need to have an age constraint that currently we just don't have. Thank you all very much for your questions and thank you very much for Evan, Evan for answering them. It's been a pleasure being with you here tonight. Uh, for tonight's event and being able to participate in this Gallagher presentation. And I will turn it over to Steve Hubbard. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Hubbard, I'm interim department head of the Department of Geoscience. Um, just a few uh, comments and announcements. First, um, uh, uh, Dr. Smith, you did just a really wonderful job kind of sharing your scientific insights into something that, you know, is pretty tangible to us, something we often think about. Um, just a great example of uh, connecting science with our communities. Just uh, outstanding, outstanding. Thank you again. Um, uh, uh, I also, of course, at this point, need to thank uh, the Gallagher family for their ongoing support of this public series. Um, our students, faculty, staff, alumni have all been made richer by being able to learn from world-class researchers and scientists like like Mr. S Dr. Smith. Um, if you're interested in supporting our research or any other faculty initiatives, uh, please visit our faculty website at science.ucalgary.ca. Additionally, there will be a link included in the post-event survey that you can follow. Um, we have one more event uh, scheduled uh, for the 2020-2021 Gallagher Colloquium Series. On March 4th, um, Mr. Paul Bauman, a technical director for the uh, for the advisium, we'll be talking about searching for water in humanitarian crises. I look forward to having you join us next month for Paul's talk. I look for registration details in your inbox or by checking out our website again at science.ucalgary.ca. Lastly, uh, when you see our event survey in your inbox, please take a moment to, to, to fill it out. The link to give will be included in the survey in case you're interested in doing so. Your feedback is important and we want to hear from you. Again, thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening, stay warm.